Hello, and this is the first episode of the new series of the televised version of the Newscast podcast. Hooray! Oh. I felt like someone should cheer. Uh, we're celebrating with the new look studio. We've had a glow up. Is that how you say it? Oh, definitely. A glow up. Is that what you <laughs> say? No, it's glow up. Oh, I say. Glow, you know when people, yeah. you know when old people say, like me say like young people phrases like glow up but the, with the wrong emphasis. And like, slay. Tick, like tick tock. <laughs> what was that, Paddy? Slay. Oh, and, slay. Oh, and, oh, I overpronounce it. And J, J Z. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think you actually have said that on air. No, I haven't, <laughs> but an esteemed colleague once did. <laughs> anyway, talking about um, pronunciation, Paddy, I've got. I need to seek your advice as a as a Radio Four legendary presenter. <laughs> How do you say the number that's one five zero zero? I would say fifteen hundred. Yeah, I'd say fifteen hundred as well. Actually, fifteen hundred. I because I'm torn between fifteen hundred and one thousand five hundred. 1,500 sounds bigger, but 1,500 is easier. Well, it's let's go with 1,500 then, because this is the episode that is marking 1,500 episodes of our daily podcast on Ooh. BBC Sounds since we started seven years ago. So we're going to carry on doing what we've always done, which is talk about the news with our pals on this episode of Newscast. Oh, and we've got a cake as well, which you might be able to spot there. Ooh. But unfortunately, we cannot yet have the technology to give you a piece of that cake through this screen. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Adam in the Newscast studio. And Chris in this, yeah, sparkly new studio. And Alex also in the studio. You two are near the artificial plant <laughs> and I'm, I'm Paddy planted next to Adam. So welcome to this televised edition of Newscast and you can hear our 1500th or 1500th episode of Newscast, the podcast on BBC Sounds after you've watched this. Um, Chris, so the theme of this episode, we thought we'd be looking at the week of the Prime Minister Keir Starmer because lots of things have happened and some of them are really quite revealing about how he's getting on as Prime Minister. Um, first of all, Alex, I noticed you've got your little uh, number 10 Downing Street luggage tag attached to your chair. Yeah, and can I just for the record say I didn't bring it in and attach it to said chair, but it was stuck to my bag earlier and I couldn't get it off, which is why it's here. But it is it is a hangover from a trip that I took with the Prime Minister and lots of other Westminster journalists to Italy. That's why it says Italy on it. It's like a dead and, giveaway. And Alexandra. And uh, my full name, yeah. Alexandra. Yeah, <laughs> Never to be used again, Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so he did a kind of... Tw this week started Sunday into Monday with a 24-hour tour to Italy, to Rome specifically, where Number 10 were branding it as a kind of continued reset of the relationship with European leaders. He's done this kind of diplomatic dash. He's done Berlin and he hosted them all at Blenheim Palace in Oxford. And this was to meet... Prime Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, Italian Prime Minister. So that was the kind of backdrop. But really what they were talking about, a lot of the focus was on this issue of migrants and particularly mm -hmm. migrants making sea crossings to reach other countries because Italy's been right at the forefront of the whole European migration crisis for years. So Keir Starmer was going over to have a look at how they have managed to reduce the number of people coming over quite substantially. And it's so interesting seeing seeing the pictures of Georgia Maloney and Keir Starmer, and not just because Georgia Maloney is great at like pulling funny faces or like doing funny things with her arms to make sure that everyone looks at the photos of her. But this is somebody who her political party has got fascist roots way back in the mists of time. And three months ago, she was Rishi Sunak's best pal in Europe. And now those two things combined, you then have her being Keir Starmer's best pal in Europe. Um, I just thought it was quite, quite, yeah. quite a turnaround. completely different political perspectives that they come from. There's like, you know, no, making no bones about it. But when you got the, them stood on the press conference together and all of the pictures and those kind of walking through the beautiful gardens of this Italian villa and all the rest of it, they were like, obviously, I mean, you would expect it because they're allies as countries, mm. you know, Italy and UK are allies. They work together. World leaders work together with people of different political persuasions. That's kind of the way it goes. But what was particularly interesting that Keir Starmer was pretty clear that he was going over to learn lessons about immigration from a party that does sit on the right when mm. he leads a Labour government. So I think that in itself was interesting and did get some pick up from people within his own party. You know, the intriguing thing just on this European reset thing, which is the kind of badging that, that the government is giving to this nipping to various places around Europe. So there's been Rome and there's been Berlin and there's been, He's been Paris, Paris and well, there's Dublin. And Berlin loads, actually. Uh, yeah. Is, you know, what does it actually add up to? So it definitely adds up to a government that has an instinct for a closer relationship with Europe. And certainly when Keir Starmer looks at his own side, that's the kind of prevailing wind on his own side, whereas the prevailing wind for a succession of Conservative leaders was to maximise a bit of distance. But... 
what does it actually add up to? And certainly when I speak to EU types, they're, they're saying, oh, it's all this warm stuff's fine. They note that he's not been to Brussels yet, perhaps sensibly politically, given the headlines that could have accompanied Keir Starmer, you know, who, you know, really didn't like Brexit, et cetera, et cetera, initially. Well, and also they've been that. busy setting up a new European commission as well. Well, indeed. It's taken ages indeed. Yeah, there's, there's all of that. So you just wonder in the end... Yeah, warmth gets you some distance, but how far can it get you before you hit those sort of compromises and red lines around the single market and blah, blah, blah. And brick walls, which is that that Brussels doesn't want you to negotiate if you're Berlin on the single market. Push off Olaf might be the way to say that in English. Mm. And it's been fascinating to watch the Germans crimp the borders of Germany. Imagine how Rishi Sunak would have coped with that. If he hadn't called the election, he could say... Italy's brought down immigration by using third-party processing. Her, the plan that Rishi was going to use didn't involve processing, did involve third countries. Germany's crimping its borders. Uh, now that would make him look a lot stronger on some of the anti-illegal um, immigration platforms that he had. Well, you know, let's zoom in on that bit you said there about third countries, because at one point it looked like um, Keir Starmer, who had, with great fanfare, junked the Conservatives' Rwanda policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda to be processed in the Rwandan asylum system, in favour of this Italian policy of sending asylum seekers to Albania. So is is Albania? So Albania would be okay while Rwanda's not. Well, part. there's an important Explain. distinction. There is a very important distinction in that there's a difference between the two policies. So the Rwanda policy was that if it ever got off the ground, people would have been sent to Rwanda, claims to be processed, but if they were granted asylum, they would have stayed in Rwanda. Whereas the Albania scheme is effectively, which is an Italian-Albanian deal, is that Italy would send people, asylum seekers, to Albania, where there would be centres run by Italian officials who would process the claims there. And if those claims were granted, if people were granted asylum, they would then return to Italy so that's the, that's a really important distinction between and the two schemes. Someone was telling me today that I think Albania might be a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. And Italy and um, Albania have a very close relationship, which yeah. is large. And this scheme actually isn't off the ground yet in Italy. It's something that's, I think, going to start in the next month or so because they've been building the centres in Albania and all the rest of it. Um, but nonetheless, having said all of that, it is really interesting that Keir Starmer did express a very clear interest in looking at something like that, which shows, I think, if I'm honest, that you know they are conscious that they're going to have to do something mm. around the small boat crossings because the numbers this year have exceeded 23,000. And obviously we had the tragic news of more deaths in the channel as people were trying to reach Britain. And let's hear Keir Starmer being asked a question about this by a journalist called Alexandra for some. <laughs> I've always made the argument um, that preventing people leaving their country in the first place is far better than trying to deal with those that have arrived in any of our countries. So I was very interested um, in that. And in a sense, today was um, a return, if you like, to British pragmatism. Actually, we rewind the week, though. So that was Monday he was in Italy. Sunday, when you're doing Broadcasting House, Paddy, the big story was that Keir Starmer's wife, Victoria, had received a big bunch of free clothes or she'd received clothes that had been paid for by a political donor. That was in the Sunday papers on, on Sunday morning, wasn't it? Yeah. So this is seen as a big kind of distraction from the first three months of being the Labour government. It's not seen by commentators on all sides as at all comparable to Partygate or being accused of and then finding as you've lied to Parliament, which is what happened to Boris Johnson. But nonetheless, these constant freebie headlines is not great for the project to get the vehicle moving. And in fact, tonight, Harriet Harman, uh, former acting leader of the party, has said on her podcast, ditch the freebies altogether, it's a distraction. Mm. So this momentum around dresses, glasses, frocks, and as Chris scooped uh, pay in Downing Street is really surprising for general journalists like me. There were, this meant to be about the programme, not about the noises off. And, you, and the Sundays are having a field day. Mm. And sometimes if words rhyme, it makes the whole thing worse. Glasses for passes becoming the, the kind of moniker, didn't it, over the summer? No, it was actually Just about... join the link between glasses and passes? Yeah, so uh, we have this rich Labour peer who is a big donor who has given money to the Starmers and that's been spent on some clothes for Mr and Mrs Starmer and some glasses for the Prime Minister. And the twist here around passes, it was actually one pass, but a pass for him, said donor, uh, over the summer. Temporary pass, but to go into Downing Street and do various things. And so, and 
Prime Minister since acknowledged that you know various things were declared and maybe he should have declared some of the stuff about his wife a little a little sooner. But that against the backdrop of the kind of uh, now, Downing Street see this as about being honest, but others are saying it's far too gloomy, the whole thing about having to do difficult stuff and the budget next month and the winter fuel payment and all that kind of thing. That, alongside the freebie stuff, with, as you say, Paddy, some people even publicly now within the Labour family saying, mm, not sure that's such a good idea, and privately plenty saying, mm, it doesn't look good, is, is quite something, really. Well, that's the key, isn't it? It's not about whether rules have or haven't been broken because they haven't been broken. Mm. There was a there was a delay in a declaration, but rules haven't been broken. It's just a perception. Does it look good? Yeah. What you made, and I think that at this point is what some people are asking themselves about the combination of things that have come out over the course of this last week, in particular. I wonder. It's a reminder that actually we learned in the pandemic <clears throat> and the subsequent inquiries the Downing Street operation is very thin. You know, it's, this isn't the West Wing with armies of people in a whole new building. Uh, it's very thin, the centre mm. of power. So they've been arguing about where the desks are. It's then come out that Sue Gray had a pay rise that pushed her above the Prime Minister's pay, a story broken by our own Chris Mason and Henry Zeffman. And it reminds me that the story we're talking about first, about what he's doing with European leaders, is the plan, the project. All of this stuff about your chief of staff, the desk, the dress, the football box, this is what happens to government mm. that is nothing it's not in your you lose all the agency yeah yeah. It is. It's another example, though, of that age-old political lesson, which is that your strengths can then become weaknesses. Do you remember in the middle of the election campaign when the Starmers went to see Taylor Swift at Wembley, and there was that photo of them basically on date night, and everyone was like, "Oh wow, this is this is political PR genius. He looks so normal. He's just having a he's having a really fun time." And then his stuff about the football it was a genuine passion of his for somebody who's accused of not being passionate about very much and sounding a little bit out of touch sometimes because of his his legal background and just the, the way he sort of communicates sometimes but now those two things have become emblematic of the the donor scandal and people are calling it the donor scandal whether it is or not that that label's been attached to it now and now those pictures are sort of the the epitaph mm. and then chris the, the the football thing has has grown and grown this there's, week. there's the football thing and then but, and we, this is him being given a free corporate this is the whole business arsenal. that he he's a big arsenal fan genuine football fan lots of politicians particularly prime ministers like to say that they are big football fans to be fair rishi sunak was a pretty passionate southampton fan keir starmer is the real deal football fan he properly kind of oozes football and going to Arsenal is this kind of thing to take his mind off work and all that kind of stuff. But um, his argument has been that it would cost too much in terms of policing for him to sit in the stands, which is where he would normally sit. He's got a season ticket for as well. Indeed. And so there's been a whole bit of a shebang about that. What he's ended up doing is accepting a corporate box, which costs a fortune, um, and because he thinks that's pragmatic in the context of the play, paying on the on the paying the police, the individual thing you could probably quite easily explain away, arguably around all of that. But it's when it's heaped on top of the glasses and the dresses and, and all that kind of stuff. And I've had a couple of conservatives. Now you might say they would say this, wouldn't they? Mm. But who have said, you know what, we were subject to all sorts of headlines in government about the government private jet or a freebie here and a freebie there. Gold and, paper. And that they argue, Conservatives, that they were subject to what they felt were quite pious attacks from Labour in opposition. And now there's some sort of examples when the boot's kind of on the other foot. And maybe... The football boot. Yeah, exactly. Now, it's for others to judge whether it was pious and all of that. But if that is an accusation that is out there, the allegation by some of a hypocrisy can sting a bit more strongly, I suspect. And here's Keir Starmer being asked about the Arsenal corporate box and defending it very robustly. And I was trying to think of a football pun, but I know nothing about football, so I couldn't come up with the kind of defence that he was doing in a football sense. So anyway, here he is. Since I've been Prime Minister, the security advices don't go in the stands, um, not least because it'll cost a fortune to the taxpayer in security police officers if you choose to go in the stands. I've taken that advice. I've been offered a ticket somewhere else. Frankly, I'd rather be in the stands, but I'm not going to ask the taxpayer to indulge me to be in the stands when I could go and sit somewhere else where the club and the security say it's safer for me to be. And to be fair, you know, having heard him talk away from the cameras about football, I believe him when he says he'd rather be in the stands. That's because that's the yeah, that's part of the football experience, isn't it, for lots of fans? And I think he'd much rather be in it, but just pra practically 
That's yeah. not possible. Also, he's not been accused of lying to Parliament. And, and in the case of Boris Johnson, found to have done so and held parties in Downing Street. So the things aren't comparable. But for me, as a general, you know, stooge in the room, these are <laughs> these are doorstepable, grabbable issues, tickets, dresses, mm, mm. Uh, glasses. And also it's the same time as the universal winter fuel payments being withdrawn. So it's like you can add up a price of a posh frock and it's probably more than 400 quid, which is uh, the rise expected in the biggest rise that pensioners will get. So that is the imagery and sort of stickability of a thing. Is it? Remember this going back to the expenses scandal of years and years ago. It, it wasn't the, the duck house. It wasn't exactly. even approved. It, it, it wasn't was rejected. even the big number stuff. It was the trouser press, the duck house, the moat. You know all that kind of stuff. Oh, and, actually, the duck house was in the moat. No, the <laughs> no, moat no, no, was no, separate. No, 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 no. The, duck the house was in the lake. The duck house was a. Peter Vigors, gospel yes. MP from memory, but it wasn't approved, but it became the image. Of, yeah, and I think the moat was Douglas Hogg, wasn't yes. it? This yes. is the point, and it, it comes back to the point that during the, the expenses scandal, yeah. things might have been within the rules, but it's about the way the public perceived them. And I particularly think when the, the kind of the challenge here for Kistarmer is when he has been talking about a message of change, a kind of reset, a kind of, you know, break from the governments of the past, this allows people to make the argument, and whether you buy the argument or not, that, you know, politicians are the same as each other. And at a time that we know that study after study has showed us public trust in politics more broadly is so low, I think that kind of feeds into part of the problem for him, whether, you know, all within the rules, not comparable, as Paddy says, to some actions of individuals in previous governments, but the sense, the prevailing sense that the public are left with. And then, um, Paddy, you mentioned this a few times, like the big mega scoop from Chris Mason, although he'd be far too modest to call it that, about Sue Gray, Keir Starmer's chief of staff in Downing Street, being paid £3,000 more than him after a pay rise that she received. But this, did she request the pay? Did she negotiate the pay rise or did it just appear or do we not know that? Um, I think there was, I was told that there was a bit of a back and forth, which is normal when people are in the business of, you know, talking about their pay at the start of a job. The key thing that matters in all of this is not really the number. I mean, and the number obviously creates a headline because it's higher than the, the, the Prime Minister. It's £170,000. £170,000, Prime Minister about one hundred and sixty-five. By the way, as a sidebar, there's a kind of media shorthand at Westminster about things being paid to the Prime Minister's salary, which is always slightly artificial because, you know, they get a free house and, you know, free food and usually... It's... Oh, yeah, and the senior civil servant in government departments, the Permanent Secretary, is often paid more than that too. I, I, indeed, and, you know, it's, it's a kind of calling card they can use in later life and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, it kind of is a thing. What matters here is that someone in possession of that specific bit of information which was meant to be confidential, is so annoyed about that in particular, but more widely about their perceptions of Sue Gray's power and other perceptions of a sense of injustice around the pay of others, that they were going to tell me about it with an awareness that if I could make the whole thing, to use the journalistic shorthand, stand up, in other words, prove it with other independent verification, and we spent three days doing that, that it would you know, people would notice it would become a bit of a mm. a bit of a news story, and it's quite a risk to do that when you're sharing that kind of information. So you would only do it if you were really, really motivated. Or well, do you mean it's a risk it. because what Keir Starmer has a list of the number of people who would know the information? Well, it's, so can, it would be a, sort of, it would be a, or the Orient Express it, to work out who it, it was. It's likely to be a fairly you know a limited number of people, and so that's you know that doesn't that's not risk risk free. Um, what also happens in this kind of situation, I mean, it always happens when stuff is leaked, but it particularly does in a situation like this, is that when I'm then speaking to various people about it and around it, you can hear a sort of suspicion in their voice trying to work out how I found out what I'm talking to them about, particularly when it turns out, as it did, that what I had found out in the specifics was accurate. So... What it tells you in the round is that a couple of months in, you have a government that has a row on its hands, and they acknowledge that privately, around perceptions of and views about the most senior aide to the Prime Minister. And that, if you are Keir Starmer, is not an ideal place to be.
And just to give you the very um, official answer to the question I asked about whether Sue Gray was involved in her own pay, the Cabinet Office spokesperson told the BBC on Wednesday that it's false to suggest that political appointees have made any decisions on their own pay bans. Which I didn't suggest their they own had. But no, no, yes. I, just, I thought no. it maybe, maybe sort uh, of implied in my question. Yes, it's reasonable to read that out, but just to be clear about <laughs> just what to be, we, were, we were saying. Yes, yeah. exactly. I was correcting my own question no, no, rather than your reporting. It's, it's, it's kind of fascinating, this one, though, because there's two ways to read this, right? The first one to read it is, like you say, early months, what, two and a half months in of a new government, you've got power struggles playing out in public and active leaking and briefing and anger on both sides, supporters of Sue Gray and detractors of Sue Gray, and all of that's being played out. And that is a sign of, you know... That's a problem for Keir Starmer. I suppose the other way of looking at it, if you're if you're just sort of spinning spinning your head around for a bit, is at the beginning of a new government that's likely to be in power for some time, there is almost an inevitability to some sort of power struggle. Totally. You know, yeah. while things shake that's down, like right. who's going to sit closest to the prime minister, who's going to have his ear, who's going to be the guiding force over the course of the next four or five years. I suppose the thing is like how much of that is playing out in public, which is the big question mark. And either way, Keir Starmer's really got to get a grip of it pretty yeah. quickly, whatever yeah. way you choose to perceive what's actually going and, on. And the system, you think of like the governing system and compare it with any other workplace. I mean, this is the nature of what happens after a general election, but nonetheless, these so-called special advisors who work for senior ministers and have often been working for them for a long time in opposition, suddenly turn up in these government departments. The government departments don't know who they are, what their kind of backstory is, their CV, their kind of wider employability. But from day one, they're on the payroll. So how much do you pay them? And what happened here is a lot of them were put uh, in, in a kind of holding pattern, kind of payroll, pay salary. Emergency ban. Basically. Yes, uh, which often was lower than what they were earning in opposition. So you've strove for months, for years to this moment that you would regard as magical because you're suddenly in government and then you get a pay cut and then you don't quite know when it's going to change. And then you find out that the big boss in this, if, you know, in this instance, the chief of staff is on this amount of money and you think, flipping out. And so that just gives you some sense of how all of this has come out. One quick thing I should say, and you were touched on this, Alex, there are loads of people in government who really respect and like Sue Gray, who find it, who are angered and upset that this has become public and that I've reported it that fear that stuff like this puts off people going into public life because they might have their names splashed around and talked about by people like me. But, you know, it's my job to bring you kind of a sense of what's going on in government, as imperfect as that often is, because I never know as much as I'd like. It's also about, you know, that sense of it distracting from the business of government that you mentioned earlier. And, you know, there were a party just about to go into their conference and what they're going to want to be talking about is their policy platform and the things they want to enact and the economy and we're looking to a budget. And what they don't want to be doing is dealing with this, which is another reason why I think he's going to want to get to, to get a grip of this. Yeah, and and back to your point from a minute ago, Alex, that, you know, a new government, like anyone, like a, when you've got a new job or it's the same for individual new MPs at the moment, at the exact moment you're keen to make the greatest impression is when you are perhaps collectively least qualified to know how to make the machine work mm -hmm. and people are trying to settle in. And yes, there are, uh, you know, there's one thing hearing about someone's job title, but what are they actually going to do? Effectively, the organogram is still being drawn and yes, kind of fought over a bit. What's an uh, organogram? <laughs> what is the, what the government's organogram? What is an organogram? Oh, what is an organogram? Well, you know when have you not honestly? Do you I not don't know? know what an organogram is? Is that right? It's a bit. It's a bit you like... have a very flat management structure of broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dictatorship, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a diagram that shows like who reports to who and like what's the structure of the. Oh, organization. Right. like or get right. organization. Organizational gram. Okay. Yeah. It's a good between it's... the two of us. If we'd had a what was it glow up organogram, I mean we'd have been just. <laughs> well, like, it takes foolish. me back to early episodes of Brexit Cast, like one thousand four hundred ninety-seven oh, yeah. episodes ago, when I got leaked the organogram. Of the new department for exiting the EU, and I was like, "Oh, I was like, Christmas had come early." That is quite the leak. That is quite leak. Thing on a train. <laughs> yeah, finding out Sue Gray's pay, like, oh, you feel Mavis, Mavis, look what he's got. He's got the old anagram. Could, couldn't interest many people. And it went in the file in the folder. Doris, put the joint back on the oven. Adam Fleming's got the organogram of the EU Bellerimont. <laughs> Doris, Doris! <laughs> now, look, I interrupted the more serious point you're making, Sorry. which is that defenders of Sue Gray say there's only one Sue Gray, the seniority, the experience, the extraordinary governmental experience she's had to put at the centre of a new government makes a lot of sense. 
I just wonder what Sue Gray's future is because when this has happened to advisors before that they've had so much attention and rumours and briefing against them, they've not been lifelong civil servants who quite late in their career have decided to go on the other side of the fence and be a bit more political. They've been people like Alastair Campbell, po po polit political to his fingertips, Dominic Cummings, um, what was his name under Cameron? Uh, Craig Oliver. No, no, the other guy. Well, because Craig Oliver was somebody who committed yeah. from doing yeah. all this stuff. Steve Hilton. Steve, Steve Hilton. Hilton. Oh, do you remember? It's funny. Like these people are so important at the time, and then like a few years later, you're like, Steve, sorry, sorry, Steve Hilton, if you're <laughs> listening from California. Um, but I just wonder, she's she's had a very different journey to this point from them. They were like kind of political bruisery types, and I don't mm. mean that in a gendered way. I just mean that she's had a very different yeah. I, and I, she I, might she <clears throat> she might they they might have been happy with this rough and tumble. She might not be. I don't I don't know her. So yeah, I, I heard a critique of the journalistic podcast types. The, 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 all the you us. Yes. Okay. They're obsessed, they're obsessed with process. And ultimately, this is also the, a few days when a deal's been done with junior doctors, mm -hmm. or with doctors, excuse me, a deal's been done with train drivers, which has been making life miserable for millions of people and cuts growth. If you can't go anywhere, you can't help the economy go anywhere. So a lot of things are happening. He is meeting the European leaders. I think the point I was trying to include in this discussion is that it's the distraction. These things are sufficiently big in the public imagination that they genuinely do distract. It's not fair to blame podcasts if it is true that there's a free dress some free glasses some free tickets the woman who's running the things paid more than the prime minister you've got to you've got to get a hold of it mm. it's public interest quick question that i have in my mind about sue gray does she turn up at the labor party conference and if she does how prominent is she well, I'd never even been looking at that question. Why should I gra she go? I granted, it's not a question a bit like the organogram that is going to be gripping the nation necessarily. <laughs> but why? I better, it, it's my job to try and work out. Why should she go? Why should, why, should, why should the chief of staff go to the Labour Conference? Well, it's a good question. I mean, she was there last year, um, and which I was surprised about. I mean, maybe naively, uh, because at the time she'd been hired as a chief of staff with a particular function around preparing Labour potentially at that point for government, given her vast experience working within government. But there she was. On the trip that I did to Washington, she was on the plane. She was in the room when the Prime Minister met the President. Did she, she? Was, she was in Rome. Exactly. So, so now you might think, well, she's the chief of staff. I mean, you know, mm. fair enough. But it, I, I've been quite struck at how willing, certainly in, say, that Washington case, I don't know how it was in, in, in Rome, but she appeared, when we Brit journalists briefly get invited into the White House before being kicked out about 30 seconds later uh, to get some pictures at the top of the, the, the meeting, uh, she, the, you have the two delegations either side. I think either leader had seven people with them. And she was there. So in a, pub, in a public situation in front of the in front of the cameras there was a photo that i think the mail online has of um joe biden sort of patting her on the patting her on the shoulder so i'm not saying any of that's wrong but it is a choice in that kind of role about the extent to which you are going to be a public figure and she i think sits particularly because of the backstory of partygate and all of that that kind of made her a public figure almost kind of by circumstance about how much she leans into that thing where she chooses to be in, in public. Now, talking of Partygate, as we end this televised episode of Newscast, I'm going to ambush you all with the Newscast 1500th episode cake. Do you remember when someone got ambushed with a cake? Oh, um, <laughs> well, let's not start talking about that. Let's not start talking um, about that. Yes. It's quite the cake as well. I mean, I'm very... Imp did you make it? Is it? I did not make it. it. And it's real. It's a real cake, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have any cutlery, so we're just going to have to look at it now all now. It yeah. Looks, Which is good, because it means we don't have to eat our own faces. Because oh, our faces gonna, are edible. Go on, stick your finger in. Go on. Oh, no, 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 no. Go on, stick oh, go your on. finger in. Oh. Yes, oh. that's the way. It's lovely as well. There you are. Good. Well, I, remind me not to have that bit. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll cut around that. Beautiful anyway thank, thank you very much for being here to celebrate our 1500th episode of our podcast, which actually isn't this, but is available <laughs> as a podcast on BBC Science. So if you want to hear more of this, you know where to go. And love to see you all again. And um, yeah, let's. Pleasure to be here. Let's all Happy poke. 1500th. Thank you. Let's get poking that cake. <laughs> Bye. It's really good. <laughs> Bye-bye. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC.